I've been using VimWiki for a little bit, and what I decided to do today was just go over the VimWiki syntax. Now, I'm not going to be able to go into every single last detail of every single thing you can do, because that would take way too long. If you want extra details, be sure to go check out the VimWiki syntax page in the Vim help pages. You can get to that with a colon H and then VimWiki syntax. What I'm going to be doing today is going over the basic VimWiki syntax, just enough to get you just pretty much started with VimWiki. I'm not going to be going over MediaWiki or Markdown. If you want separate videos on those, I can do them, but I'm just going to be going over the default VimWiki syntax today. So without wasting any more time, let's just go over to my main screen and have a look at this. Now, I've already got my VimWiki open, so let's just jump right into it. The first thing you're going to want to know how to do is work with links. Now, the basic way you make a link is like this. So you put two square brackets and then the text that you want inside of the link. And this will create a page that is actually named this here. So if I just press enter on this, as you can see, this will take me to link.wiki. But we can also just give it a path as well. So we could say slash, I don't know, so test slash link.wiki. And what this will do is this will actually try to make a new directory. And then if we press yes on this, as you can see, it's now put the link.wiki file in the test folder. Naming your links like this will allow you to put your wiki pages within a folder hierarchy. But as we can see, this isn't really the neatest looking name for a link. What we can do instead is we can actually give it a description. So as we can see down here, it still works in a very similar way, but there's an extra character in here now. So now we have a pipe character. We still have our two square brackets. On the left side of the pipe character, we have the location of the link. On the right side, we have our description. And the description is what it will actually show as the text of the link. So we can change this from link2 to, to test slash link. And this will now link us to the same page that this link directly above linked us to. And we can test this. Let's go in here, add some text. Let's leave this, go to the one before. And as you can see, it's taken us to the same page. So pages aren't directly bound to links. The text that you have in this link here will just link you to that place within your file system. Now, descriptions come up in quite a few different places. You can use them with transclusions and a few other things we're going to go over in just a bit. But we'll get to that when we get to that. Now, the next one you're probably going to care about is headers. And you can have six levels of headers. They're pretty straightforward how they work. You have equal signs on either side and a space between the equal sign and the text. So we can add a new header here. Like, let's say we wanted to do something like header two. This is a header, space, space, equal sign. And as you can see, it's now done the highlighting on that as well. So it's really, really easy to make a header. There's nothing too special about that. And I don't believe there's a seventh level of header. I believe six is the maximum. So let's just test that. Yep, yeah, six is the maximum level of headers. I can't see any reason why you'd ever go above six though. So this is probably enough. Now the next one we have is for lists. So there's two different ways to do a bullet style list. And it's not really a bullet style list as you can see. But the thing that's important about VimWiki is that you can also convert the entire thing into HTML. I'll go over that at the end of the video. But even though it doesn't really look like a bullet, it still will when it actually gets converted into HTML if you ever want to do that. Personally, I don't really see any use for converting to HTML, but maybe you do in your workflow. So as I said, there are two ways to do bullets. You have a dash and you have an asterisk. And for numbered lists, there's a bunch of different ways you can do those. So you can do a number with a dot on the end, a number with a, a bracket on the end, a letter with a bracket, a capital letter with a bracket. You can do Roman numerals as well. So that, that's what this is right here. So if we just make another line, put some text in here, Roman numerals. And as you can see, it will automatically continue the numbering as well, which is also really, really convenient. The same thing is true for these bullets as well. So if we make another line here and then put some text here, another line, another line, it will actually continue the bullet or the numbering syntax that we last did. Sometimes a single level list isn't enough and you want to have multi-level listing. Now, I don't typically use this too often, but when I do, it is nice to have it. And the way we do this is really straightforward. All we have to do is put our list character in and then just tab it in. And now that's at its second level. So we can keep doing this pretty much as much as we want. I don't know if there's a limit. There might be like a arbitrary sixth level limit or something like that, but I haven't run into a limit. So we can just keep doing this and keep going and keep going basically. And as you can see, you can just pretty much just cre keep creating lists as long as you want to. I don't know why you'd ever indent that much, but as you can see, it'll just keep working and keep working. So yeah, it's pretty straightforward how that works. 
Now you can actually mix and match the list styles at different levels. So you don't just have to always use bullets with dashes. You can use bullets with asterisks or bullets with dashes, or you could even switch up to numbers at a level. You can actually just mix and match these up at every single level that you go. The next list style we have in here is a term definition list. So I don't normally use these, but the way this works is you have a term on the left side, two colons, a space, and then the definition for that term. And you can have multiple definitions for a term as well by doing it like this. So we have our term on one line with two colons after it, then a new line, and then on that new line we'll have the two colons again, a space, and the definition. As I said, I don't normally use this because I'll normally be using my VimWiki just for taking notes. I normally don't have definitions in my VimWiki as well. But if that's something that you care about, then term definition lists are a thing you can do as well. Now one you might care about, especially if you're like me and you're coming from Joplin, is you actually have toggleable lists. So the way this works is a toggleable list has to have an asterisk or a dash at the start. And then what you do is you put two square brackets, so just an opening and a closing, and you put a space between them, and then you have to have some sort of text after it. And the way that we toggle these is we just press control space. As you can see, it'll just toggle as, as any other program with toggleable lists will work. And we can continue these lists like you could with other lists as well by just making a new line. So put some text here, new line, text, new line. We can do the same with these ones here. Text, new line, text, new line. And you can also indent these ones as well. So what that will actually do is make this basically a child of this one above it. So if we complete this one up here, it will actually complete all of the children as well. So you can do a hierarchy of toggleable list items basically, which I think is actually pretty cool. Now next up we have our text formatting. Some of this doesn't really work within a terminal and only makes sense when you convert it to HTML and we'll see those in just a moment. So regular text, you just write out regular text. There's nothing special about that. Then we have bold text. Bold text is done just with asterisks on either side of the text. Then you've got italic text. That's just done with underscores. Straightforward as well. Then we've got super text and subscript text. Now, these ones don't really work in a terminal just because a terminal doesn't really have any definition of what superscript and subscript is. But the way this works is you'll have two caret characters and then something in between it. And that is how you do super text. The way that you do subscript text is you have two commas on either side of the text and then some text in the middle. When you convert it to HTML, it will show it as super and subscript text. But as I said, it doesn't really make sense to do that within a terminal. Now the next one we have is just basic text formatting. Now this one's actually pretty cool. So, so what VimWiki syntax does, it kind of ignores how you do spacing and how you do tabbing and things like that. But this block here will basically make it so whatever you put in this block will be spaced and tabbed exactly the way that you write it. So if you need something formatted exactly the way that you want it and not the way that the syntax actually defines it to be formatted, this is how you'd go about doing this. Normally I don't really care that much about the actual formatting, but if you need it then this actually is here. And we can also use this block in another way. So if we give it an argument of a programming language, this case we're using Go, Basically what it's going to do is do your Vim highlighting for whatever language you're using. So if you're using Go, Java, C, C++, it'll do the highlighting that Vim actually has defined for that language. And if you were then to convert it to HTML, it's going to put that within a code block within HTML. But anyway, the way this works basically is you just pass that argument in at the start and you can just write your code as you would expect. Now, there is one slight issue. I've noticed that sometimes it doesn't actually change the syntax highlighting until after you leave and then come back in. I don't know what's going on there, but I feel like it just doesn't know how to update it properly. If it doesn't actually highlight the text properly, just quit out of the file and come back in. It's just a little bit of an issue to work with. So you can put anything in here. I don't know what languages are not supported, but I assume that any of the popular languages like Java, Python, things like that, those will all be supported. Now the next one we have is for tables. Now tables are really good within VimWiki. So, one of the really annoying things about working within tables within basic markdown is that when you put text in it, the formatting completely breaks. Not in this case. So let's say we just chuck a bunch of random text in here. If we were doing a markdown table, we'd be like, oh, this is annoying. Now we have to fix all this up. Not in VimWiki. VimWiki does all of that for you. Now I know there are plugins for Vim that'll do this for markdown files as well. But it is nice to see this within VimWiki as well. And we can do this on any of the columns here. So if we just chuck some text down here, that'll all fix it up. If we chuck some text over here, fix it up as we would expect. 
You can even get it to automatically add a new line for you. So the way you do this is go to the end of the line and you press enter and that'll create basically a new line of the table. I don't believe you can press O here to do it. If we go right to the end of the line, no, you can't press O, you have to do it with enter, which is a little bit annoying, but I guess it's not too big of a deal. Now the next one we have in here is for keywords. This is kind of just a bunch of words that have been defined within VimWiki to be special words and they'll be given special highlighting. So as you can see, the words to do, done, started, fix me, fixed, and XXX are all words that are getting highlighted a bit differently than just regular text is. I don't ever use these, but if for whatever reason you ever need to have like a to do or done or something like that, all you have to do is just write these words within VimWiki and they'll have special highlighting. Now the next one we have in here is for anchor tags and this is actually kind of cool. I didn't know about this until very recently. Now the way this works is like a basic link. So we have two square brackets, then we have a hash in here. The hash is the special character we need to make sure it's actually an anchor character. And on the left side of the anchor character we have the file that we want to work with. No argument means the current file. And then on the right side we have the header we want to jump to. So as you would expect, you can also put a different file in here. So say we wanted to jump to my podcast file and we wanted to jump to episode notes. We press enter on here and that jumps us into the podcast file to episode notes. And also pressing backspace will then take you back to the previous file you're on, not the previous file in the hierarchy, which is also nice to see as well. I believe you can also add a description for these as well. So if we put a pipe character in here and say this is a description, yep, you can add a description in there as well. So if you don't want the text to be the fact that it's an anchor tag and you want it to be something that's a bit more descriptive. Then you can do that as well. So this still works as we would expect. It'll jump us to our episode notes. The next one we have in here is exactly what it says in the header. So you can just dump raw URLs in here. So let's say we wanted to dump a link to YouTube in here. We just press enter on this and it will open up our web browser and open it up in YouTube basically. Or we could also dump say like a mail to link in here. We press enter on this one and it will try to open up whatever program you use to do your emails. Now I use Thunderbird, but that doesn't really matter. You could use something like Mutt or whatever it is you want to do emails with. We can also do FTP links, but I don't have something to test that with. So the way you do that is FTP colon, this is an FTP link or whatever you want to put in here. Obviously you don't have a space, but if you know what an FTP link is, you know how FTP links are actually formatted. The next one we have in here is for external files. So as we can see in here, it's very, very similar to a regular link. So we still have our two square brackets on either side. But the one thing that's different in here is this file colon at the start. File colon basically says that we're looking for a file on our computer. And the next thing we have is the actual path to the file. You don't have to use an absolute path. You can also use a relative path. So if we replace this uh, slash home slash Brody in here with this right here, so just saying basically our home path, and we press enter on this, this will still open up the file, but I prefer to just have the absolute path in here just because I've had some problems with relative paths with certain programs in the past. So as you can see, works as we would expect still. Now you can also give this a description if you don't want to just have the path sitting there. So as you can see, this next one is the exact same file, but I've included a pipe character and said outro. So now when you're just looking at it, it just says outro rather than the entire link. We open that up, works the exact same way still. Okay, now transclusion is a little bit different. Transclusion is similar to external files, but what transclusion is mainly for is for working with when you're converting it to HTML. So it's just going to create an image tag rather than the external file one, which will create a hyperlink. So that's the only difference between those two. When you're just working within Vim like this, they act the exact same way. So if we open this up, this will just open our web browser and basically have a link to the Vim logo. And we can also give this one a description like all of the others. We just have the link and then we have our pipe character and then just the description we want to use. So I'm just calling it Vim logo just because that's what it is. Open that up, works the exact same way. Nothing too special about that. Now there's a couple of other miscellaneous things I should mention here as well. So this first one we have is for doing a comment. Now obviously when you're working in Vim like this, a comment doesn't really make any sense, but this comment here, when you convert it to HTML, it will be converted into an HTML comment. So obviously it won't show up visibly on your web page. So if you do convert stuff to HTML and you do want to use comments, this is how you would go about doing that. You can also do a horizontal line. So in a web browser, you know how you can have the HR tags. 
This right here will just be converted into an HR tag. So if we wanna use those between any lines, all we have to do is just add this in. So let's say we wanted to have a break between these sections right here, and then we want to have one between these sections right here. That'll just create an HR tag and do what an HR tag does basically. Now I've been mentioning this the entire time, but it's really easy to actually convert your Vim wiki into HTML. And there's two ways to do this. One is you can convert just one page to HTML. The other is convert all of it. So let's just run them both. So if we go Vim wiki to HTML, if we spell that correctly, all this is going to do is just convert this single page into HTML and this will just be dumped into our home directory into the vimwiki underscore HTML directory. We have a look at this and as you can see, it's a very, very ugly looking web page. Now, if we were to click on any of these links in here, it's going to say that it won't actually be able to find those files because we haven't actually generated HTML for those files. All we have to do though is just go back to this and go vimwiki all to HTML and give that a second to process all of the different files and it's gonna keep generating a bunch of different files in here and give it a second. Okay, now it's just done. So if we were to open up the index file here, wherever that one is, index, cool, open this up. And now if we were to just click around, this will just work as we would expect. So let's say we wanted to go into my video ideas, let's go into MPV scripts. Yep, that, that works as you'd expect. Now we can go back and back. If you were to set this up like this, you'd probably want to have some way to actually go back without having to go back within your web browser. But that works well enough, I guess. Now, being such a basic web page, the other neat thing you can do is chuck this into W3M and just go W3M, zoom in on that one, W3M Vim wiki underscore HTML index dot wiki. And then this is just a basic web page pretty much. So we can just go into any of these links. Like let's say we want to go to the podcast page, and then we want to go to say, I don't know, the uh, notes for Kenley's episode. This works as we would expect it to work. So nothing too crazy there. So it just works perfectly fine within W3M because it is just a basic HTML page. It has a little bit of CSS. As we can see here, there is this style.css. It's not a very good style.css. So if I was doing this for anything outside of just this very, very basic generation. I'd want to make this CSS file myself, but if all you want is it converted into HTML, this will work well enough. So I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to mention. Now, obviously, as I said at the start of the video, I didn't go over every single thing that you can do in VimWiki. There's a lot of stuff that I left out, like the diary stuff and the calendar stuff, but if you want to have a full list of every single thing you can do, go check out the VimWiki help pages. So to get to those, you just write colon H VimWiki syntax, and then that will basically open those up. So I went over pretty much everything that'll get you basically started with VimWiki and a lot of extra stuff that you don't really need to know about as well. So I think that's pretty much everything that you're going to really care about. So before I go, I just want to thank my patrons. So I want to thank Joachim, Nathan, Tiki, Andre Road, Tony, Elku, Larry, Ray, and Zilva. And that's still a really long list. It hasn't grown yet, but when it does, I don't know what I'm going to do. But anyway, if you want to support the Patreon, there'll be a link to my Patreon down below, as well as my Amazon affiliate links, where you can buy any gear that I use in this channel, or just literally anything you want on Amazon, and I'll get a small kickback for it. Also, remember to go check out my podcast, Tech Over Tea. That's released every Tuesday on Library and every Thursday everywhere else. And yeah, be sure to go subscribe to this channel and ding the little bell icon down below, and remember to comment and leave me a like. So I think that's pretty much everything for me now. I am kind of rambling with this outro, and... I'm out.